to An Oral History of the Church. I'm Jonathan McCormick. And I'm Adam Crispin. An Oral History of the Church is a conversational church history podcast coming from a Christian historiographic perspective, discussing subjects by volume or season. On this podcast, we consider history in art form. Let's get started. Well, Johnny Mac, uh, last time we spoke about the role of the social sciences and history. Uh, it may be, uh, listener, that you hadn't considered the difference before. You th- thought maybe history is just one of the social sciences, that they're one and the same. Don't they all function along those lines? And in one sense, yes, of course. But uh, as we talked about last time, history attempts to tell us about what happened in the past in as clear a form as possible, interacting with primary source documents, secondary sources, and tertiary sources. The social sciences also interact with primary, secondary, and tertiary sources, but they seek to uncover what's in between that which history focuses on. So it fills the gaps on the economic side of... um, whatever era you're looking at. It looks at the social psychology of the Ptolemaic Empire, or uh, or it looks at uh, anthropology and, and all of these other niche questions that someone might have. And they, they uh, try to work hand in hand with the historian to present a fuller picture of what the world was like in that place and time. But this time around, we have uh, our new topic, of course, and it's our next to last episode, actually, for this volume. It's our penultimate episode for this volume. Yes, in this episode, we finally get to talking about history writing and methods of history writing. Uh, we're discussing history writing. Uh, Adam and I are really excited about this uh, this episode. Uh, we really enjoyed our class on historiography together, um, and we think that it's important to see sort of the breadth of the ways you can write history and uh, a bit of how we approach it. That's right, especially because we would like to keep this podcast going and we thought it might be fun to kind of kick off now that we've moved beyond the oral history project that we started with uh, tracking the kind of the recent history of Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary now Gateway Seminary um, we thought it would be fun to have something we could point to as well this is how we approach history. This is how we think about it. This is how we come to it. Um, So uh, future future volumes will probably be less focused on um, the process of history so much as the actual discussion of history, but uh, we just thought it would be neat to get into that first. So um, here we are, uh, as I mentioned in the last two episodes now, this one and the next one, before we finish out this volume. So let's just define history and not just define it in its as it goes, but define it in contrast to history writing. Right. Right, because there is a there is a difference. Uh, I hadn't really considered the difference uh, at a conscious level uh, prior to uh, my master's work, uh, certainly never in in high school or before and not even in college i hadn't really consciously considered the difference between history and history writing so how would you define uh history johnny mac generally history is the events that happened Mm -hmm. Uh, whatever we're looking at so if we're looking at the history of Christianity or the history of the church 
what happened that brought the church from being this small subsect of Judaism mm -hmm. to a major world religion. Right. Uh, what made it go from being predominantly a Hebrew or Aramaic speaking group to now may the the largest speaking groups are English and Spanish and Chinese. Right. Uh, none of the only one of those was a language at the time of Christ. <laughs> History writing, on the other hand, is the attempt to present this in some sort of coherent manner, including the important stuff and leaving some stuff out. Uh, right. <laughs> Which we've started discussing in uh, anecdotes in previous episodes. Because cert certain things are genuinely historical. Uh, we... We are just on the other side of a presidential election. Mm -hmm. uh, it, whether you like our president or not, this was a historic occasion. Right. Whereas six months ago, Donald Trump having uh, a, uh, a taco bowl... Um, on the top of Trump Tower. Interesting <laughs> photo. Not really history. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's not what people go to the books for. What did he eat on a particular day? Unless you have some real, real obsession with the history of presidential food, <laughs> and then you're such a niche person that i think you might be the only person on the planet with that interest <laughs> actually even more interesting to me personally is the history of the taco bowl <laughs> i'd much rather know that <laughs> i agree um, <laughs> so history writing is the process that you determine what's important and what goes into it mm -hmm. right because you you have to make choices all along the way. Choices to put stuff in and choices to leave stuff out. I mean, at its basic level, what do you put in comes down to what do you want to study? What do you want to get down? Do you want to write about the history of chivalry? And, uh, and you want to focus on... Uh, concepts of chivalry in the medieval era maybe even uh maybe something else maybe you want to look at uh recent more recent concepts of of chivalry or uh or spanish concepts of history in the the periods following the medieval era and uh maybe you want to study chivalry in uh post medieval Spanish literature. Now we're talking about Don Quixote. Now, finally, I found a way to shoehorn Don Quixote into one of our episodes. We're going to spend the next 40 minutes talking about Don Quixote. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But um, I think, you do I have think to make you're choices. You're tilting about... at windmills about. <laughs> ah, I don't have my drum set here to give you the. Me not uh... wanting Don Quixote. <laughs> so, um, my point is you, you start off with a choice. What, what do you focus on? And so if you're focusing on uh, the history of um, water rights in in uh, the, the west coast of the United States, then you're, by definition, not looking at countless other things. So you, you're including this, which means that anything that doesn't relate to your topic can't go in because it's going to waste space and time. So as interesting as Don Quixote is, and as weird as that musical was that they wrote about it, based on it, that doesn't belong in a book about uh, Western United States water rights history. 
other inclusions and exclusions may reflect not just your interests and what you're the topic, but they may also in, be influenced by your histori uh, historiographic philosophy, uh, your philosophy of history writing. Mm -hmm. So whatever you th think is important about your subject and about history in general is going to also influence how you frame it and what you include. Mm-hmm. So we had talked about Marxist historiography. Um, right. One of the trends within Marxist historiography is what's called a people's history. Um, and so this focuses on the common person and marginalized groups within social structures. Mm -hmm. uh, you could contrast this with the great man theory and method of history that sort of says each period is defined by great people mm -hmm. uh, and their their exploits. Right. So uh, Abraham Lincoln was a great man in the middle of the 19th century. Let's see how he shaped 19th century America and the effects it has today in the 20th and 21st centuries. That's one example. Uh, whereas a people's history of that era might be, uh, let's deal, our primary sources are the letters of Union and Confederate soldiers back to their families during the Civil War. Do you think that would be a fair example, Johnny Mac? Exactly. Or uh, slaves in the, in the war, mm -hmm. freedmen uh, on who escaped or volunteered to fight in the war or people, you know, back on the home front diaries of the, mm -hmm. uh, the people trying to build those, uh, repeating rifles to get out <laughs> to the front lines. Yeah. Right. Or per, uh, journals of the abolitionists, right. Who ran the underground railroad and so on. Yep. These different framing devices mm -hmm. and focuses reflect what you value in history and how you think history should be presented. Johnny Mac, what's the next one on our list here for types of history writing before we present our not-so-secret perspective on it? Another one that I find fascinating... Um, and since we've been mentioning Mar Marxist historiography a lot, um, I think it's just fair to um, to give someone else who doesn't agree with Marxist historiography, but not particularly because of uh, theological or materialistic uh, critiques of it, mm -hmm. but of historiographic critiques. Uh, you know, it's not always fun just to beat the same drum of, well, these people aren't Christians, so they're <laughs> bad historians. Right. Well, some people, there are there are strengths and weaknesses to these historiographic methods in schools. Mm. Uh, there's the Annals School of uh, Historiography. It is... Uh, a French school, and it is it mainly looks at social history, but it rejects class analysis. So it re it rejects Marx's theory mm. that all of these social that social history should mainly be read in terms of class warfare, uh, but that there are other corresponding components that shape uh, shape society besides class. Yeah. Uh, the the idea that if everything is a hammer, uh, I mean, if your only tool is a nail, everything looks like a hammer. Right. Uh, that's sort of their critique of Marxist historiography. 
well, everything is class history, so we'll hit it all with with class. Right. <laughs> with the hammer and sickle. With the hammer and sickle, yeah. <laughs> we have nothing to lose but our chains. Um, <laughs> but it's possible that sometimes the, the political divisions aren't because of class. There may be times when, to go into the modern era, a the rural poor in the United States mm -hmm. seem to identify with a multi-millionaire uh, real estate tycoon. As improbable as that sounds, <laughs> that's what just happened. Yeah. And so it the the annal school wants to find these other things that connect mm. social trends besides class that they're identifying shared worldview mm -hmm. or regional um identities mm -hmm. that may be more important than than class. I wonder if historians of the future will look back at the 20th and 21st centuries and add a new category of celebrity to those different um, cohesive units that they find. I think you may be right. I'd be curious uh, to know. <laughs> I don't think I'll get to live long enough to see it. I'm not in Certainly there are famous people throughout history, but, you know. Well, this isn't like a modified great man theory so much as um, yeah. people uh, rallying around, you know, identifying them as, well, these are Beyonce people. like, Or, or a better example, these are Oprah Winfrey people. They bought every book that she put out of her book club. And they bought all the special things in, I don't know what store she puts her stuff out in, Macy's or Target, whatever. You know what I mean? Like, we wa they watched her show every day. They listened to her radio show back when she did a radio show. And um, actually, she may do podcasts now. I don't know. But do you see what I mean? I, I don't know. Just conjecture. Yeah. I, I, I realize now that I'm wasting time. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. I, I think you're hitting on something, something real. Like I said, I, I don't think we'll we have enough data uh, in 2017 to know if that's going to be a real metric that they're going to use alongside like regionalism and the other examples you brought up. Um, Leonard Sweet uh, considers himself a futurist. He's a ministry leader elsewhere, mm -hmm. um, uh, but he th he thinks that there's a a shift taking place right now on the level of the shift of uh, uh, Gutenberg mm -hmm. with um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, there's one other social network he lumps in there. Uh, I think he grabs Google for some reason. Uh, I guess he's the last person still using Google Plus uh, who isn't employed by Google. <laughs> well, you know, Google does own so many different companies and apps like YouTube. True. And so on. Yeah. I mean, how many people use Google you know, Docs and you, Google Hangouts and uh, and all the others? Google Maps. It would really have been difficult to read everything that somebody wrote a hundred years ago. Yeah. Uh, as it was happening. I can know what Kanye West is tweeting about as he's recording his newest album. So yeah. he, I can find out I'm putting a bassoon in this, this track mm -hmm. as he's recording the bassoon. Right. That's, that is a really weird phenomenon that <laughs> gives a, an idea of connection, a depth of connection that no one would have ever perceived no one would have thought they were best friends with a famous composer they never met right yeah. <laughs> right yeah 
Yeah, that's uh it's it is a real shift. It's a major it's a major change. Uh, Sweet talks about uh, the the Gutenberg generation and the Google generation, how we are changing from reading books in print to getting them as ebooks or getting them as audiobooks. And those are just the first examples he uses when he talks about that. You know. We may come back to him at another time, but he's not who we plan to talk about in this episode. <laughs> uh, let's move forward to our our particular view. Yeah, uh, we've kind of given away the uh, the secret ingredient. The whole this whole volume, though, Johnny Mac, uh, as our regular listeners will know. This volume, we've been opening with uh, one of our sentences being on this podcast, we consider history an art form. This is how we approach history. Jonathan and I both got this, became uh, especially convinced of this. Maybe uh, Jonathan was headed that direction before. Uh, I actually never asked you that, but we were certainly both convinced of it uh, by the end of our historiography seminar with Dr. V. Phillips Long. Dr. Long is um, a biblical historian, so he focuses on um, uh, the narratives in the scriptures that are uh, historical, and his particular area is the Old Testament. So he focuses on the history of the monarchies and the history of Joshua and Judges or uh, the Pentateuch histories. Um, but he has his per, go ahead his biggest interest is in King Saul mm -hmm. um, but um, he's done a lot of work throughout the, the rest of the um, Old Testament history right and he's given a lot of thought to historical method and has uh, written um, quite a bit about it uh, so he's done history, and he's also written about how to do, how he thinks it's best to do history as well. He has a bit of an art background, and in class and in one of the books that we'll recommend, uh, he does give an extended illustration from this artistic background um, on how history is an art form mm -hmm. or like painting a portrait um, right exactly he talks about choosing an angle and choosing uh what colors do you want to use to portray light and shadow and so on um as jonathan mentioned it's 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 an extensive illustration that he uses uh, portraiture for uh, as a, an example of how to do history <clears throat> but I think it's I think it's quite winsome because it I think it best accounts for ultimately what the historian does we earlier talked about how the historian has to choose what do you focus on okay how do you frame it okay what do you not include well, we, we got to make sure to keep this detail in. Oh, you know what? I got some space in the back, so let's let's put that little detail back there. That's interesting. It's especially interesting to me, and it relates, even if it's not exactly there. So, um, I think it best accounts for all of the actual the the way a historian literally does history without um, requiring a certain standard. Um, we now have our uh, Palestinian hills here, and let's give ourselves some happy little Philistines up right. here on the mountain. Or maybe some not-so-happy little Philistines, <laughs> if David just recovered the ark or whatever. <laughs> but yeah, um, it, uh, there, what it does is it allows the, the historian the freedom, viewing history as an art form as uh, portraiture, like painting a portrait of a person. That was quite alliterative of me. Of me. <laughs> anyway, treating history 
like an art form where you are painting a picture gives you the freedom to be honest about your subject, which you should do no matter what school of thought you use when you write history. But also, it gives you the freedom to 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 be unique in how you're coming at your subject. So you are being unique, you're being honest, and you're honest about being unique. You're saying, this is my take on this person or on this movement or on this event from history past. Um, there's no, there's no false standard set where, oh man, I've got this really good, uh, uh, biography of, uh, <laughs> let's say St. Augustine ready to go. Um, but I haven't written anything about how, uh, Augustine relates to class issues and, and and what he means for the proletariat. Oh man, I gotta go back and 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 set that all up so I can have a a, a, a real biography. No. If you if you take the school of thought that Jonathan and I ascribe to, it gives you the freedom to present a picture as best you can without putting in a, a a false frame that um, may not be necessary at all to your subject. One of the things I think Dr. Long is attempting to respond to is there was a tendency in Enlightenment and modern, um, as in the philosophical movement of modernism, uh, modern history to 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 make history names and dates right uh, we're gonna make as, this an exact science and i appreciate wanting to get back to the sources and doing a quality job mm -hmm. with the source material mm -hmm. but i think it is unwise to make the humanities a science right um because you you can't uh history unfortunately is not testable observable or repeatable right you know? <laughs> as much as i wish uh bill and ted's excellent adventure was in fact a documentary um uh I, I'm afraid that Napoleon never ate a ludicrously large ice cream before going to a water park. Um, <laughs> Ziggy piggy. And in that same, <laughs> same vein, we, we can't get any time machine and go and stand there at Waterloo and watch Napoleon lose. Right. Um, so I think one of the things that Dr. Long and other people who have worked with his idea um, are getting at is that it's okay to tell history with a particular end and deciding what you do and do not include. That's right. And part of it is for the emotional impact. Um, I didn't, I wasn't thinking in these terms to answer Adam's earlier question uh, until uh, we read this book from Dr. Long. It really was a paradigm shift for me. Mm. Um, but an author that I think exemplifies this thing in a way that that's quite enjoyable um and gets you can get you away from the the nitty-gritty um the the nickels and noses um there's a book called the day lincoln was shot um and it's a chronology of 24 hours from before lincoln died to the minute he he dies um hmm. And early in the book, it's 
you know, a really relatively stable, calm narrative of the political events in Washington as it's heading to the, the end of that day. But in that final hour, the way he, he isn't as down to the minute in moving between character to character. Uh, and it gives a sense of the disorder and chaos that certainly uh, Lincoln's uh, family and cabinet and friends would have have felt not uh, there were some points where they thought that this conspiracy had gotten everybody and then later in the night they find figure out no the assassin who went after the VP got too drunk and never went uh, and <laughs> never went to kill the vice president. Uh, sometimes the feeling of the event, uh, the feeling of being there, mm -hmm. is what you want to communicate with this this portrait of Lincoln. Yeah. I have another example if uh, if you're done talking about the, that particular book, Jonathan. Yeah. There's a book that came out a couple of years ago now by uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Karen Swallow Pryor. Uh, she teaches at Liberty University, and she wrote about uh, somebody named Hannah Moore. The book is called Fierce Convictions, The Extraordinary Life of Hannah Moore, Poet, Reformer, Abolitionist. This is another book that takes more of a portraiture school of thought um, crack at presenting a biography. So this this digs into who this person was on all of these different angles, um, her writing, her um, political activism to end slavery, uh, who she was as a Christian, as well as really who she is as a person as well, intellectually and uh, uh, affectively and so on so that's another uh, a good example if you're looking for another interesting uh, biography to read that's along these same lines and then but the my favorite example is one we talked about in class Johnny Mac and that's the example of the four gospels yeah it's it's very common of course in the church and in academia to s understand that the four gospels are four uh different in that they are unique presentations of the life and uh death and resurrection of this same jesus of nazareth what the biblical authors did is they tried to present what they understood of who Jesus was, what he did, what he taught, what he said at other times, what happened to him. And it's each of, each of them comes from their own kind of particular point of view. Uh, some argue that that means that there's a particular audience in mind, and there are a few who say, no, there's no audience in mind. They are merely presenting their own perspective in how they do this. So that, that debate is worth having, but my point is that each of these authors comes at it from a different way. Matthew presents a very Hebrew-minded, Jewish-minded um, perspective on who Jesus was and what came before Jesus that led up to this moment that Jesus fulfills with his life and death and resurrection. Mark is very much in the moment. Uh, he uses the word immediately a lot. And it, it keeps you in the scene. Immediately this happened and it just feels very action oriented and almost rushed. Uh, with a very uh, 
a kind of Roman or explanatory mindset where he's regularly um, translating phrases or words for the reader from Aramaic to Greek. Uh, Luke comes at it from a more clinical perspective, uh, kind of the the day Jesus died kind of angle, to borrow from the day Lincoln was shot uh, book, where he <clears throat> he has a bit more of a organized, chronological kind of account. And then there's John. John presents what is undeniably the most theologically rich and theologically minded presentation where it's it's more than chronology that matters to john he wants to make a particular point about jesus clear he tells you what that is in the first chapter but he he has a particular point he wants to get to and so he he accomplishes that in his gospel so each of them talk about jesus of nazareth at the same time each of them come at this biography in a different way. There's the specter of historiography that somehow an interested party writing history is somehow less <laughs> right. helpful or objective or whatever <laughs> right. than someone from and the I outside. Don't, than someone from the outside. And yes, there there can be benefit from an outsider's perspective. Certainly. But we don't want someone who's emotionally detached from uh, what's being discussed either. Yeah, and, uh, and someone emotionally detached can be of great help, but we don't want that to be the only voice. We are not helped very well if the only person talking about a historical movement or moment or... Uh, person is the only voice his history writing is taking part in a conversation about what happened in the past a conversation by definition has to involve more than one person <laughs> or at least more than one personality <laughs> so, one would hope <laughs> yeah so we have to read more than one uh, book or article or whatever to get a real firm grasp on anything from history past. Some of us will only ever read one item on certain things. Uh, Jonathan and I both read an article this week, the same article, about a man who is in the most bizarre reality show in the history of the world, I think, from 1998 to 2002 in Japan... And it involved him only living on those things that he won by mail-in sweepstakes. I'm probably never going to read another article about that. There probably isn't even a single book on that guy. You know, and I'm okay with that. But I'm not going to debate that either. If someone wants to come up with a claim about that, I'll say, okay, that's interesting, and move on with my life. But if there's something I really want to hold firmly to... Something I, I want to find a conviction about, we have to read from multiple voices. You say there's only one article and probably not a book about this this man who lived on nothing but uh, things he won in a contest. Well, I say challenge accepted. What? <laughs> what is happening right now? <laughs> uh... <laughs> I just got... Okay, we can cut that. Um, <laughs> I'd like to keep it. <laughs> we can write... I can write a book about that crazy, crazy man. I'm not saying you couldn't. <laughs> I'm just saying there doesn't currently exist a book, and probably there never will. <laughs> Again, challenge accepted. <laughs> I will give you $100. I have $100. a new dissertation topic. I will buy one for a hundred dollars cash from you if you write it and get it published. <laughs> I'm willing to put I'm put I'm not cutting this part out of the episode, Johnny Mac. This is going on the internet <laughs> for perpetuity. <laughs> the first person to write a history book about that guy 
gets a hundred dollars from Adam Chrisman. I'm saying it right now. <laughs> and hopefully, whoever my external reader will be is not listening to this episode. <laughs> Man, I don't know why he's so late with it, with his latest version of his uh, of his dissertation. I don't. He's working on what? <laughs> <laughs> why did we let him in this program again? <laughs> okay. Well, we should probably move on, or at on least move on from talking about that of... weird reality show. Go ahead. <laughs> on a more serious note, of things we would recommend and like everyone to read. Um, we've dropped this name before and we'll drop it again. Uh, v. Phillips Long writes, uh, the art of biblical history. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's the, this book is the exemplar of how to do this method. Philosophy books can be boring. Uh, fair. That's fair. Long did not do that. Uh, his. <laughs> Agreed. It is well paced. It is enjoyable as a book. Um, uh, enjoyable as something worth reading. Yeah. Um, and he doesn't lose the reader in in jargon. When he uses technical terms, he explains them if he doesn't think the audience is going to be aware of it. But he's dealing with some pretty important ideas and developing it in a way to a reader who's may not be well read in historical philosophy right he so he didn't write a book to convince the 80 year old expert at oxford or yale he wrote a book for anybody who's interested in the method of history writing and so aside from the fact that I find his method really compelling and helpful, uh, it's just a good read. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another book we'd like to recommend. Adam, do you mind uh, grabbing this one? Sure. We've actually brought this one up before as well. <laughs> we might as well get these two out of the way early. This is a book by a scholar named John Fia. His last name is spelled F-E-A. The book is titled, Why Study History? It's an introductory kind of book. It's not very long. It's a, a, a survey, kind of the whole process of history writing. So it's it's method. It's a philosophy of, of historiography book. But also it talks about why. Why do we do what we do? Uh, and... Um, I think in the in the combination of what he has there that that it makes it a real valuable little volume um well worth reading uh similarly accessible to Dr. Long's Art of Biblical History. Uh Adam and I have a few other texts that Adam's gleaned and that I've taken uh, a look and looked through some of these mm -hmm. um that are worth Mentioning, uh, just because we mention it and think they are worth your time, doesn't mean we agree with everything in the book. Right. Um, but they give a good state of the field. Mm -hmm. um, so the first one to 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 mention, and one of the things I like about this is that it's a history of history, <laughs> um, historiography. Ancient, Medieval, and Modern by Ernst Breitsch. Uh, he's, he gives a history of history uh, from, uh, from he points the origin in Greek poetry. Uh, I stand up as a Christian historian and wave and say, uh, hi, we've got ancient Near Eastern historia for historiography <laughs> that predates that. Right. Uh, <laughs> But, but that's okay. <laughs> um, setting that aside, it, it's a good history of history. Uh, covers the, the big picture. 
I haven't used that book myself, but I'm I'm very interested to get into it. The next one uh, the... is uh, a book by John Lewis Gaddis. Gaddis is spelled G-A-D-D-I-S. This book is called The Landscape of History. Uh, Jonathan, why don't you tell us a, a bit about this one as well? Uh, I read this as I was working on a, uh, a project we may or may not get to in the, uh, our next uh, uh, volume. And he sort of does a similar thing to what I was arguing about against history as science. You know, not that we should ignore um, data and exclude things because we have an ideological axe to grind, but that it's okay to not for history not to be a science. Yeah. And then he gives a it's a more secular perspective, but sure. a a similar perspective to what Dr. Long presents in a biblical uh, uh, the art of biblical history. Mm. Uh, I found it an interesting and helpful read. Uh, and again, uh, he's it's an enjoyable read. Yeah, well, this next one is a bit more of a, a college level kind of textbook. It is called The Method and Skills of History, A Practical Guide. It's in its third edition, I believe, at, at, at this time. Um, I've got a fourth edition for it oh, here. All right. Uh, this is written by Connell Furray and Michael J. Salivary. So this book um, is both theory and practice. So it gives the reader um, a philosophy of historiography, and at the same time, uh, it it's a practical guide. So it includes um, primary source documents or, or excerpts of primary source documents with exercises for the reader to put into practice those philosophical um, decisions that Furry and Celevery have put together. Another beneficial component of this text is its appendices. Mm. Its appendices have a number of really good uh, bibliography and samples of citation. Uh, so if you're trying to figure out how to cite things. Uh, sometimes historical texts are a pain in the neck to cite. Um, <laughs> Certainly true. It it shows that very well and gives you some good things. Hey, read this um, to try to work on your history uh, writing mm. skills. Yeah. Another one that is uh, a introduction. Uh, it's a very short introduction. Uh, ha, ha. Um, <laughs> it's from the series of very short introductions by Oxford University Press. Uh, History, a very short introduction by John H. Arnold. Uh, this series is a very nice series. And this is, again, a, a very helpful book. Um, that gives you an introduction to the current state of the discussion of of history writing. Hmm. Um, and as well as a little bit of methodology and the importance of things that are mentioned and things that are not. Uh, mm. it's it's a quick relatively easy read again um, but it's it's worth the time of the investment and is also a, a a decent reference tool for reminding you what's this issue again um, sort of a, a thing to keep aside when you're trying to read other history texts yeah this uh, The next book is by John Tosh, 
It is in its sixth edition now, as of two years ago. It's called The Pursuit of History, Aims, Methods, and New Directions in the Study of History. This book, it strikes me as... Uh, now, Jonathan, you, you put this on the list here. I'm just, I just happen to be the one introducing the name. It strikes me as similar to John Fia's book, but it goes to more depth and it adds some other questions... Um, and it's a bit more technical. Would you say that that's probably a fair way to put it? It is. It's it's a pretty technical work. It's a little bit different in perspective from Fia, mm -hmm. um, but not dramatically. Um, and he does give attention to um, post-colonialism as a movement, uh -huh. which... I think is something worth in listening to and engaging. Uh, Post-colonial thought is the idea that we can and should get beyond uh, Eurocentrism mm -hmm. and reading all of history through a European lens. Yeah. So listening to the history from the perspective of the uh, majority world. Mm -hmm. well, that's not the only thing that he does. Um, sure. The limits of historical knowledge chapter is going to be quite helpful um, because you do have to admit sometimes we can't know what we want to know. Mm. That's, you, you that's can't, often too true. <laughs> we may not want to know that Donald Trump ate a, um, a taco salad on some Wednesday in the middle of uh, September. Uh, <laughs> we might have some other questions about what he did behind closed doors uh, leading up to the, the election or afterwards. Right. Um, and some of those closed door meetings may never be we may never know what happened in some of those. There's a couple classic texts that I would like to recommend. Um, they are obviously dated, as I'm calling them a classic text. Um, so one of these that I'm mentioning, the author died in 1943. Mm -hmm. um, so there have been movements and critiques of his perspective. But I... I would have to say that these are worth reading if you want to be a historian to know, again, the state of the conversation. Uh, the, the first is The Idea of History by uh, R.G. Collingwood, mm -hmm. uh, and he discusses the schools of historiography. Mm -hmm. And his schools are very similar to the ones that we used earlier in the, uh, 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 our podcast. But he also talks about how to use the sources and how to use materials mm -hmm. and the pitfalls that he encountered in his time as a professional historian. Uh, it, sort of the culmination of his life's work. Mm -hmm. um, it's published posthumously as well, I believe. Yes. Uh, it had been a, um, a lecture series that he gave, and then it was edited by um, one of his... Um, one of the people he influenced um, and brought it into a, a full book. Uh, it's very much worth the time to read it, even though certainly there are newer books that discuss some of the same ideas. The last one I would like to mention is a, a bit of an oddity in this, the list of our recommendations, because this is a theology of history rather than a philosophy of history. Um, mm. uh, 
Reinhold Niebuhr wrote Faith and History, a Comparison of Christian and Modern Views of History. Mm. And he specifically go addresses some of the weaknesses of some of the other historiographic schools mm -hmm. that were available in his day. Mm -hmm. Again, this was from 1945, so there a thing or two has happened since uh, Reinhold Niebuhr wrote wrote his work. Uh, but again, he was a professional historian. He did a mm -hmm. did wonderful work, um, and it's. It's worth the work of reading it. Um, yeah, yeah. Reinhold Niebuhr is a uh, was a significant uh, Christian mind in the 20th century. Little uh, trivial pursuit uh, data point for you, Johnny Mac. Did you know that it was Reinhold Niebuhr who wrote the Serenity Prayer, made famous by Alcoholics Anonymous? Yes. <laughs> Did you know he? threw it away or was about to <laughs> i did not know that part of it he wrote it he wrote it on a napkin walked up to the to the podium read it, this rather extemporaneously and was going to throw the note away and one of the people who was his friend and colleague who published it and pop made it popularized said, hey, that was really cool. Can I have your note? He's like, <laughs> okay, and gave it to him. <laughs> you never know what really will strike people in your, your body of work. <laughs> That's right. Man, your book about that reality show guy is just going to take off like you don't even know. <laughs> yes, I will go down in history as the guy who wrote about a really weird japanese reality show <laughs> that'll become your thing like you will be professor of uh reality show history at like some uc or whatever <laughs> uh, it would pay the bills <laughs> <laughs> you'll be the one tracking how many times the supreme leader said you're fired before he became president <laughs> Oh, we we do need to know what Arnie's going to say when he fires people as he <laughs> takes over The Apprentice. Oh, actually, I think that new season already started. So we probably already know. Or at least people who care about that show and watch it probably already know. <laughs> yeah, I live in a hole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm writing a dissertation, too, and also have kids. <laughs> anyway... <laughs> let's talk about our next episode uh it'll be the eighth episode of volume two and as we mentioned earlier it'll be the final episode of this volume uh yeah i'm actually uh, uh, sad to end this one but excited because we'll have two volumes in the can dude like that's kind of cool that we have gone this far <laughs> Um, we've been working on this podcast for over a year. Can you believe that? I uh, do, but it's it's been a good time. Yeah, I mean, we started publishing them in April of last year, but still, uh, pretty cool. So um, it's a it's about this week that we had our first um, first recorded interview. That's right, with my uh, doctoral advisor, Doctor Melick, who is being a very uh, obedient. Uh, advisor, by the way, I am on interrupted status with my seminary while I uh, find work and a place to live. And uh, in interrupted status, you're not supposed to have access to your professor, your your advisor. And he is abiding by that rule, I'll tell you right now. <laughs> I have tempted him with multiple emails, and he's been kosher the whole time. <laughs> anyway, uh, so it's been pretty cool. Uh Anyway, that next episode comes out uh, two weeks from now, just like always. It will release on February 10th of this year. We're, our focus for this last episode is to give you some practicum. So we've talked about uh, 
historiography and we've culminated it with this current episode you're listening to on how we think historiography, history writing should be done. And so we're going to give two examples next time and discuss them. Do we think that these these two pieces did well in their history writing? Uh, if so, how did they do well? If not, how did they uh, how did they fail, and and how could they have done better? Uh, we may hear a lot about that latter portion because one of the two examples is going to be a bit I wrote about New Testament history. So yes, I'm going to inflict that on you, dear listener. I hope that you will bear up under it. And then the the second piece was uh, so I got to pick one, and Johnny Mac got to pick one. And the piece that he picked is an essay by a scholar named Gerald Bray, who wrote a biography on Augustine of Hippo. It's going to be good stuff. I'm actually really looking forward to that conversation. And that will be in two weeks on February 10th. Uh, If you have any questions for us, we want to hear them. Uh, if, If they've been just building up inside of you, just waiting to be asked... We are here and uh, ready to answer your questions in uh, our episodes of the podcast. Uh, if you if you get these in in the next uh, week after this episode comes out that you're listening to right now, uh, we can kind of almost guarantee that they will get read on the air next time and answered, of course, on the air. We will not read them and then mock you. Probably, uh, we will we will definitely try our best to fit them in and answer them as best we can. Uh, so if you'd like to do that, you can get them to us by email at churchhistorypodcast at gmail.com. Again, that's churchhistorypodcast with no no periods, no dashes or hyphens, nothing like that, no underscores, just churchhistorypodcast at gmail.com. You can also tweet at us. Our account is at oralhistorypod. Or you can hit us up on our Facebook page. Just look up an oral history of the church right there on Facebook. We'd love to Dear hear from Adam you. Christ- Dear Adam Christman, how do you type with boxing gloves on? <laughs> oh, that was a kind of a deep cut, dude. That was good. <laughs> props. You have my props. Our- <laughs> Our other podcast, Saints Gone Before, uh, has been uh, going through some documents of importance related to the Protestant Reformation. Uh, We've looked at the Sligheim Confession, or we've read the Sligheim Confession, and the letter of Martin Luther to Leo X. The next episode will continue Martin Luther's Concerning Christian Liberty. Uh, This is a very important document Mm -hmm. uh, for understanding Lutheran's uh, theology of uh, what it means to be a Christian. Uh, We we would call it today the uh, the priesthood of the believer. Yeah. And already Uh, uh, we we've got uh, two parts of that out now as of the recording of this episode, and just those first two episodes have such interesting um it's just so rich uh, such interesting uh phrasing on on the issues uh a lovely perspective i think on on what it means to be a christian uh i think that um you folks will enjoy the rest of it as well and you know actually i'm gonna i'm gonna put this question out johnny mac real quick it's not in the show notes but um Listener, if you listen to this podcast and the Saints Gone Before podcast, would you drop us a line at one of those uh, contact points I mentioned earlier? If you are interested, I could edit together the whole thing if you would rather listen to it all at once rather than episode by episode with the uh, the intro and the outro and the music in between. If you'd like, I can edit it all together. Uh, I can find time to do that. And make it just one audio file, um, and release that as an episode. 
if you would like that, please let us know um, if there's if there's interest there. If there's no interest, we'll just keep going the way that we've intended. But if you'd like it as one big chunk, um, please let us know at churchhistorypodcast at gmail.com or on Facebook or at Oral History Pod on Twitter. We want to meet your needs. So let us know uh, what you think and how how our project is going. Yeah. Do anything else from you, Johnny Mac, before we sign off? Thank you, listener, for in- enduring my uh, sarcastic comments and Homestar Runner references. <laughs> uh, I'm sad when I'm flying. <laughs> all right. <laughs> we'll talk to you all next time. May God bless you as you go. He's already gone before. Oh,